This is a special Fragication Fridays in Education uh, by Pixel Dreams. Uh, stay tuned for education.com and your PD mailing list for more events in the future. But for this uh, special event, we've got Energize to give us an intro. So uh, I'll throw it over to our, our uh, Matt, favorite hammer, Energize. Oh, thank you. Uh, cool. OK, well, I'll keep this short. I know we're all here to hear Dr. DiCarlo, not to hear me talk about Dr. DiCarlo talking. So for anyone who is new um, and a little bit unfamiliar about Fry Education, quick, quick recap. What is Fry Education? It's a community we launched about a decade ago, which is crazy to think about, um, celebrating our thirst for knowledge and for wisdom. Fry, first three letters of Fry Education, represents the Fridays. Our company historically has taken off to explore, learn, and experience new things, whether they're speaker engagements or going on a field trip. The latter part plays on the word education. And yeah, put them together and it makes Fry Education. We're in branding, so no shocker there. Today's for education is definitely a hot one, in my opinion. Thinking critically about conspiracy theories. Come in handy at the next uh, family dinner we all attend. The last, I think, 12 months, our research team has been researching the subject diligently. We've uncovered some fascinating data and info and insights. While there's enough content for a university course, imagine that, today's for education will remain somewhat high level. I'm sure everyone will have a ton of questions. I think, Daniel, you mentioned this a little bit earlier. Well, oh my gosh, a special surprise appearance. Um, we will save that to the end and we'll open the floor for Q&A near the end. Our virtual lecture will be presented by none other than the Dr. Christopher, Dr. Christopher DiCarlo, our in-house critical thinking advisor and philosopher. Dr. DiCarlo, also known as Doc, and sometimes Richard. There's a story behind that. He's authored <laughs> several books on the subject of critical thinking, including a bestseller, How to Become a Really Good Pain in the Ass, A Critical Thinker's Guide to Asking the Right Questions, and his most recent release, So You Think You Can Think, Tools for Having Intelligent Conversations and Getting Along. So, Get excited, mute your mics, because I'm handing the proverbial mic to Dr. DiCarlo. Take it away, Doc. Thank you very much, sir. <laughs> All right, can everybody see that? Sure can. Good stuff. All right, folks, so. in collaboration with Pixel Dreams. Uh, do we have to do a shout out, a disclaimer, that these are the views solely of mine and do not necessarily express those of Pixel Dreams or the... Yes, that slide clearly was lost in translation, but please yeah. go for it. Sure. So these are my ideas, a lot of my ideas, but they were done in conjunction with, with the writing team uh, at Pixel Dreams. Uh, we're writing a guidebook we're writing a guidebook that helps people to have conversations with conspiracy theorists and those who are, are affected by them. And the book itself is divided into these two parts. And in the first, we wanna understand the nature of conspiracy theories, why people believe them and, and so on, a bit of the history, the background and that sort of thing. But then we wanna help not only the conspiracy theorists, but those who are affected by the conspiracy theorists. So, the book in this this talk is is in two parts, and basically, in, in order to to find out what goes into the, into the making of a of a conspiracy theorist, we have to consider a lot of factors, a lot of causal influences that contribute to their particular states of mind. What this will allow us to become is better enabled in understanding the physical and cultural constraints under which they they act, which bias their particular points of view. So. We can we can better understand uh, what's going on uh, in in their world. Now, to begin uh, with the book, we talk about well, what 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 do we mean by conspiracy theory? Generally speaking, this is a very basic definition. It involves a story that regards a group of people who are believed to be conducting secretive activity, which generally harms others in some capacity. That's a very 
a general definition, but it's a good what's called uh, operating definition. It's the one on which the, the book is based. Now notice we refer to it as a story and not a theory because the term theory is really confusing here, right? Theory, as, as we know it in science, is an evidence-based and extremely well-established body of scientific information. So the theory of relativity, the theory of evolution, these ideas have been demonstrated to be unfalsifiable and confirmed over and over and over again so that they reach the highest status in knowledge that we can possibly give a body of information, and that is theory coming from the Greek theoria, which is exactly what I'm stating, a collective, well-established body of information. You look this term up online in any dictionary, you'll get this definition, and right underneath it, you'll get this, a hunch or wild guess with very little supporting evidence. And we think that's gone a long way in confusing people about the term conspiracy theory, because it seemingly adds credence to uh, a set of views, but it's also used in a kind of derogatory manner. You know, that's just a theory. Uh, many times I've done uh, God debates and people will say, isn't evolution just a theory? And I say, well, yeah, it's just a theory, like gravity is just a theory. Um, so it's been difficult over time. When we look at the etymology of the term conspiracy theory, it goes back a, a hundred years or so, and then it comes forward. There's a lot of uh, discussion as to its origins or etymology, um, but it really hasn't done a great service to having these discussions about these unusual ideas that people might have about these types of events. So um, we believe that you know, when we're talking about knowledge, and especially knowledge about really important issues and topics, we need to reserve the term theory wherever we can for information that's attained according uh, to the very highest standards of knowledge. And so this is what we've come up with in terms of definitions. We, we call a conspiracy story that, you know, which conspiracists believe to be true, and it's often without sufficient evidence or proof. Not always, but often. A conspiracy myth is a story which has been falsified. So if you think the, the, the moon landing was faked, you're wrong, uh, based on the evidence. You know, we, we should always follow where the evidence leads us. The evidence is overwhelming in favoring that people actually made it to and walked on the surface of the moon. So then we would just call that a conspiracy myth. And then a conspiracy is, is the story. You know, it's the story that somebody has that in some cases turns out to be true. So Watergate began as a conspiracy story, it got proven. MK Ultra, the belief that the CIA was using LSD uh, on unsuspecting and unwitting uh, uh, characters to see if it could be used as some kind of brainwashing or truth serum, turned out uh, to be true. So um, we might, you know, we might just simply have to stay with the term conspiracy theory because maybe it's just too entrenched into the current vocabulary. So. Maybe we're trying to swim upstream here and uh, we're, we're swimming against the current. So we might just be stuck with, with using that term. But to be you know, specific, to be clear, this is really what we're talking about in terms of information related to uh, conspir conspiratorial ideas. So let's look at the first part of the book. Uh, understanding the nature of these conspiracy theories and those who believe them, we have to look uh, essentially at things like biases, right? And, and, and what are they and how do they contribute to the making of a conspiracy theorist? Um, we know that biases influence and constrain people in different ways. And the way in which we act upon, think about and act upon information is due to how we're, we're biased. Now, how we eventually come to acquire and revise and retain opinions uh, or beliefs about you know, various issues, it's really a long process of development and it's influenced by both internal and external biases. Uh, for example, even prior to our birth, there were causal factors at play, uh, which influence and bias how we understand the world. And so it's really important to understand how these influences uh, function within us so we can better understand why conspiracists believe the things they do. So there are many types of biases, but they really come down to two types, biological, and cultural. And Cal, I deliberately put 
found this picture. This is free on Wiki Commons, but it, the, the writing is in Arabic, which I found rather interesting. Um, and so what we what we find is that when we look at uh, our biological biases, what we find, you know, we can ask ourselves, well, what are what what factor do my genes have in play in playing out on believing in, in conspiracy theories? And so we, we've all remember uh, biology class, DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. Uh, this informs cells how to uh, differentiate and function under specific conditions. Uh, but DNA is also responsible for behavioral traits as well, uh, including humans, and biases us in, in many ways according to the history of our DNA. This, however, does not mean that uh, humans cannot act otherwise. We're not puppets. We're not entirely puppets. Uh, according to our DNA, there are many other factors uh, at play, but nobody that I know of is a, uh, a genetic determinist that based on the genes you have, you definitely will act in a particular way. It's much more complicated than that. Um, human beings are not dancing bees or marching ants, which are very much directed according to their DNA. Uh, we are conscious beings, and as such, we seemingly uh, possess the capacity to control or alter our behavior. Uh, but how much control, then, do we really have, right? So I want you to consider two examples. Uh, we have a fictitious Janice is a 28-year-old woman from Chicago, Illinois. She's watched several people in her family uh, suffer and die from Huntington's disease. Uh, based on her genetic lineage, she faces a 50-50 chance of possessing Huntington's disease gene. Uh, so there's an equal chance that she will either develop symptoms of, of this particular disease or she won't. Uh, Bob, a 57-year-old man from Lincoln, Nebraska, has inherited genes largely responsible for NPD, or Narcissistic Personality Disorder. This disorder is a mental condition in which people have an inflated sense of their own uh, importance and value. They have a deep need for excessive attention and admiration. They have troubled relationships often. They have a lack of empathy for others. Behind the mask of extreme confidence, though, lies a very fragile uh, self-esteem that's really uh, vulnerable to even the slightest criticism. Uh, so recent evidence indicates that such a disorder is often found in people who believe in conspiracy theories. So in the first example with Janice, the expression or non-expression of genes is either going to cause her to develop Huntington's disease or it's not. Right? The odds are exactly 50-50. In the second example, gene expression may cause Bob to believe in conspiracy theories, but it might not. Right? For not all narcissists are conspiracists, but a large percentage, what we're finding, of conspiracists happen to have this particular uh, genetic predisposition. Now, let's look at the other aspect of biological biases, our brains, right? You know, did my brain make me do it? Well, we know our brains are responsible for uh, how we understand the world. Uh, if you or someone you know has suffered from mental illness, you'll understand the ways in which they are biased uh, to see the world differently simply because there may be a chemical imbalance within their brains. And so it follows that those who are afflicted with specific forms of mental illness are going to be biased in ways that cause them to understand information differently. Now, our research has found uh, a number of, uh, of, of characteristics, and we've put these into what we call a psychological profile. And what we're finding is, aside from things like narcissism, there are various uh, genetic and neurological factors that contribute to um, the development of conspiratorial thinking. Topping the list is something known as schizotypal personality uh, disorder. Uh, people suffering from this are often uh, described as being loners, having flat emotions, limited, sometimes inappropriate emotional uh, responses. Uh, they have persistent, excessive social anxiety, incorrect interpretation of events, feeling that something is actually harmless, but has a direct personal meaning, peculiar, eccentric, unusual thinking, beliefs, or mannerisms. Sometimes they develop suspicious or paranoid thoughts and constant doubts about the, the loyalty of others. Now, 
uh, social psychologists uh, attempt to identify what we call uh, specific predictors of belief in determining who might be a, a, a conspiracist. Uh, and these give rise to various conspiracy theories in attempt to understand and we want to potentially help people manage these, these beliefs. Now, some of these predictors of belief include things like people who have odd beliefs or, or believe in magical thinking. This can be a subtype of, of schizotypy. Machiavellianism, uh, for those of you unfamiliar with the political theorist uh, Machiavelli, who wrote a, a great work called The Prince, and it talks about how to control, how uh, leaders can control their subjects in specific ways. Um, often there are there's vulnerable and and grandiose uh, forms of narcissism, uh, primary and secondary psychopathy, and these help us to uh, better predict the likelihood for people who who are conspiratorial in their thinking. Um, on the most harmful end of what we call the conspiracist spectrum, which you'll you'll see in, in the next few slides, uh, where conspiracists exist on the spectrum, on, on the furthest end, they can be very strategic, manipulative, dominant, and callous. And of course, I'm going to put this in just because I can. Here's Mike Pence. He's walking away, apparently. There are people who want to talk to him. Um, so when we think more about the biology behind conspiratorial thinking, um, what we can ask ourselves is, what does the conspiracist get out of it? Like what's happening on, on their end? And in order to think about that more carefully, I've, I've talked about it in terms of sex, survival, and status, and the way that affects our, our brains. So. One of the things we have to do is always keep in mind that we've been emotional beings long before we've been rational beings, right? Our brains have evolved over millions of years in ways that influence our behavior to achieve very specific goals. In biology, the two main goals are, in no specific order, uh, say them with me, sex and survival. Um, attaining both of these goals does not simply have a practical benefit. Uh, but it's incentivized with a great neurological payload in the form of specific neural transmitters. So in other words, doing certain types of activities gets us high. So in this way, all humans, and for that matter, really all mammals, are constantly on drugs. You, know? you can remember uh, when you were a kid and you were at the beach having a great time or somebody was pushing you on the swing or you were at an amusement park on a specific ride or being cradled in your mother's arms at a specific point in your life, any of those types of things, um, that kind of joyful, warm, exuberant thrill experience that you were having during those times, they're all the direct result of specific neurotransmitters coursing through your brain and, and basically making you high. Things like uh, serotonin, dopamine, vasopressin, oxytocin, all of these types of neurotransmitters have a, a specific effect on all of us. Uh, for the record, knowing this about ourselves in no way diminishes the value of the experiences we have as a result of our evolved brains. So if you think you know, I'm coming off as too mechanical, too mechanized, that doesn't uh, take anything away from the value or the import of the experiences that we have at a given time. Now, our brains have evolved to get us to behave in, in specific ways because it increases, or hopefully increases, our likelihood to survive and reproduce. So that's why eating food tastes so great and why uh, sexual activity feels so incredible. Evolution models our brain with great neural payloads uh, so we will behave in particular ways. Taking substances like alcohol or cannabis or hallucinogens, these are really evolutionary shortcuts. In other words, these produce um, payloads without us actually having to do anything at all. Um, but in all biological uh, ecosystems, every species, including humans, seeks to attain and maintain a relative comfort level and this is known as biological equilibrium. So every species, 
uh, no matter which one, tries to find a kind of comfort level between predator, prey, and, and this is what we refer to as biological equilibrium. Sometimes a subset is referred to as homeostasis or having a balance. That's why you see the, the, the uh, Anuk Shuk there. There's a balance that we try to attain and then maintain that balance. We call that physical health. So how you're feeling on a given day is your biological equilibrium. You come in contact with some nasty virus or bacterium and your equilibrium goes down. You take some medications, it comes back up. Uh, you've just won the lottery. It goes way up. You're feeling great and whatnot. Uh, but then other things happen. It comes back down again. So we, we always try to maintain this kind of uh, meso or middle area we, we define as biological equilibrium. Now, we have to act in ways that are going to increase the likelihood that we survive into the next day, right? So we need to find things like food and shelter and tools and security and so on. But we're also driven to reproduce. And a lot of our time is preoccupied in the determination of finding a mate or at the very least uh, <clears throat> in having sex. So whatever cultures have evolved throughout history, they're the direct result of our genetically hardwired programs to survive and reproduce. In this way, right, biology always holds culture on a very short leash. And as such, we seek information and activities which increases the likelihood to attain those two central biological goals. History has well demonstrated that those who can attain the greatest status, the greatest resources, and the greatest influence within a specific group will increase the likelihood to attain those two goals. It should come as no surprise then that emotionally, many conspiracists see themselves as possessing privileged information which in turn they believe increases their status, which at the same time gets them high. Now, this is what I refer to as mimetic equilibrium. This is essentially the idea that all the cultural art artifacts that we come in contact with, from our hairstyle to our clothing, to the types of music we listen to, to the advent of electricity, to the medium through which I'm speaking to you right now, are all cultural artifacts uh, Dawkins refers to as memes. And I think it's a very handy term. And so just as all biological species try to attain biological equilibrium, humans also have a lot of stuff, what Jared Diamond calls cargo. We got a lot of stuff. So these memes, we find ourselves trying to develop an equilibrium amongst these, these memes, including our ideas. And so, Attempting uh, to get somebody to uh, give up their memes, to give up that mimetic equilibrium, especially if they think they've got information that nobody else does or very few people do, and that you silly sheeple don't quite understand what's going on in the world, but I really do, they believe they're in possession of very, very important, very valuable, very unique information. And they're, get, they're getting quite high off this. And if you're trying to have a conversation with a conspiracist, you have to you have to remember that you know much like deeply religious individuals, you know people are often find themselves quite uncomfortable um, if their views are challenged at a given time. You got to understand their beliefs represent to them the most important information possibly attainable. No other information is important as important, and no other information gets them as high as what they believe to be true. So it's extremely important to remember, to remember that when talking to a conspiracist, it is not unlike talking to a deeply religious individual or an alcoholic or a drug addict, right? If you try to introduce information that contradicts their current worldview and, their, and what the, the beliefs that they cherish so much, it's like trying to falsify the existence of God to a very religious person or taking the bottle from the hands of the alcoholic or the needle from the, the arm of the uh, heroin addict. Um, they will see you as the problem, as that which stands between them and their joyful uh, highs. In that sense, you are the buzzkill and hence you will be perceived as the problem. Now, the neurological and biological drives of the human condition, combined with the complexities of ideas generated within cultures around the world, creates the desire for many in, uh, individuals to seek out information and resources 
that will increase their status and maintain both biological and mimetic equilibrium. These emotions have been with our species for millions of years, and they're extremely strong predictors uh, of belief. Now, whether uh, we're consp conspiracists or not, uh, our emotions often get in the way and overrule our critical thinking capacities. So we must know what we're in for when talking to a conspiracy theorist, for much of their current identi identity is intimately and emotionally tied to their current less, con uh, less conventional beliefs. So if we can understand how such biases influence a conspiracist, then we're gonna be in a far better position by which to help them, by which to have a dialogue with them. So let's look at some cultural biases. Those were bi the biological side of things. Let's look at a few and, and keep in mind, I'm only giving you just some of the highlights of the book. There, it'd be impossible to get everything in in a, in a 40 minute, 45 minute lecture. So I'm gonna just touch on some of the highlights. Now, in terms of ethnicity, how are people biased by their ethnicity, right? Why you know, do Arabs and Jews and Turks and Greeks and, and Indians and Pakistanis and many other ethnic groups around the world dislike one another to the point of terrorism, war, or even genocide, right? War and conflict create a social psychological phenomenon in which we objectify, objectify and vilify the enemy as subhuman, as being less than human. So we define the enemy as the other, and in so doing, we can dehumanize them. And we often find that groups compare the other to various forms of vermin or pestilence. So uh, for example, in World War II, uh, uh, Joseph Goebbels produced propaganda films in which he used the analogy that Jews were like rats. They'll move into a city, they'll carry pestilence and disease, they'll multiply, and they'll make everything worse for, for everybody. Um, Trump referring to Mexicans, uh, as and, and, and they have been referred to as cockroaches who come in to a country and do the same thing, disease, pestilence, and whatnot. And so... Um, when we dehumanize the other, it creates in, the, in, in some minds that it's easier to harm them or bring harm to them because they are equated with lesser creatures. And since they're just like those lesser creatures, it doesn't matter. You know, we kill vermin, we exterminate, you know, vermin and that type of thing. So then it creates a, a buffer within the human mind to be able to do this. Um, so ethnicities which have been... Um, at war for generations, uh, often remember and foster hatred for their enemies for centuries. So it should come as little surprise then that there's a considerable amount of indoctrination that goes on uh, at, the, at the ethnic level about the other. And it doesn't matter whomever that is, it's just part of the human condition. So when we look at religion as a influence as a cultural bias. We, we do not need to go on too far into history, right, to witness the atrocities brought about by specific world religions fueled by conspiratorial thinking. Now, to be sure, many um, world religions have accomplished great things, right, from great works of art to uh, the compassion for the sick and the downtrodden uh, and, and the dying. So if religious beliefs are not harming, uh, any other humans or any other species, none of my business, not my concern, not my pig, not my farm, doesn't concern me whatsoever. Uh, but if any ideology, either religious or secular, generates harm, we have the right, uh, I think some might even say we have the duty to speak out and to act out against that type of harm. So just one example to demonstrate conspiratorial thinking is known as the Jewish blood libel. Uh, towards the end of the Dark Ages, in Western Europe, uh, an idea began circulating that on an annual basis, a Jewish cabals, cabals would choose a child from a village, a Christian child, um, around the time of Easter or Passover, basically to mock the passion of the Christ. Their blood would be harvested for use in secret rituals. Now, in 1173, the monk Thomas of Monmouth he stated, and this is a direct quote, it was written that the Jews without the shedding of human blood could neither obtain their freedom nor could they ever return to their fatherland. 
Hence, it was laid down by them in ancient times that every year they must sacrifice a Christian in some part of the world to the Most High God in scorn and contempt of Christ, that so they might avenge their sufferings on him. So, as fear of such atrocities circulated, so too did the rise of anti-Semitism evolve and morph throughout Western Europe. Uh, let's fast forward some 900 years to the present, and again, we're witnessing massive massive beliefs in the United States and elsewhere about a satanic cabal feasting on the blood of innocent children. And of course, this is the basis of the current phenomenon known as QAnon. Um, I find this to be the most dangerous conspiracy theory we have witnessed uh, in a very, very long time. So what other uh, conspiratorial uh, factors uh, from culture Education, right? levels of education play, they factor very uh, uh, heavily in, in susceptibility to conspiracy theories. Some prominent research papers speak to the inverse relationship between increased education and decreased belief in conspiracy theories. Here are just a handful of them. Analytic thinking reduces belief in conspiracy theories. Education predicts decreased belief in them, changing them through rationality and ridiculing teaching the conspiracy theories for what they are. Now, <clears throat> we have to be careful here because there are plenty of highly educated people, uh, people with PhDs, uh, who maintain belief in at least some aspects of conspiracy theories, right? Anti-vaxxers or 9-11 uh, deniers. So when we talk about education here, really I think what we should be talking about is critical thinking, uh, a specific subset. Of education because just education alone might not have as much an effect in terms of critical thinking as being specifically trained in that area of, of pedagogy. Uh, when we look at the media, this is perhaps the greatest cultural influence on humanity uh, worldwide. It's not surprising to see its effects uh, happen on conspiracy theorists, right? We know we're constantly inundated with information coming from all sorts of, of different forms of media. Over the last two decades, there's been quite the rise of what has been called fake news, especially online. Information on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or any other uh, social network can be deliberately created or fake to look as though it's real, to make it look as though it's reliable. We have to constantly be on our guard that such fake accounts of, of, of information exist out there. We have to become media savvy, media literate, right? We have to empower ourselves with critical thinking skills that will allow us or anybody to recognize when information is not factual, right? We cannot simply believe everything we see or read just because it's on the net or we, or we hear it from somebody. So we have to constantly check where we get our information, what the sources were, how reliable is that, right? And you know, we have to be aware that all information, no matter what type, comes to you, comes to me, comes to everybody already biased. It's already kind of pre-biased, uh, including this very lecture, right? I have biases as well. So there's no such thing as bias neutral information. And we have to understand that. And we have to work within that context, not with simply with conspiracists, but with ourselves, we have to clean house, as it were, right? Physician, heal thyself. So we have to do a bit of a bias check, right? What are biases, but really filters of information? When you experience new information, it's got to get through a number of your biases before you're going to consider it, accept it, suspend judgment on it, or deny it. It's got to work through those, those filters. And the more aware we are, the more we can do a mirror test and look at ourselves and ask ourselves, honestly, why do I now believe what I do about X? It goes a long way towards us better than, you know, uh, having the better capability of seeing why others whose biases might differ from ours or that are acting differently on them would see things differently and why we come to a different conclusion. So it's very important for us to do this bias check. Um, we, we have to be uh, constantly on our guard that there is no such thing as bias neutrality. All information 
the minute we look at it, it's biased because we are the ones that possess those those very biases. So considering how they affect our thoughts and influence our actions is one of the clearest ways to help us better understand why we have disagreements in general so that we might be able to better engage the conspiracist in healthy and helpful dialogue. So un unfortunately, sometimes the world doesn't cooperate. And sometimes there are events in the world that occur that cause an uptick in the amount of conspiratorial thinking. So our research has indicated that conspiracy theories tend to undulate. They go, come and go in, in various waves. And they tend to correlate very highly to major societal upheavals like wars and natural disasters, even the stock market crash and whatnot. Here's the very first, uh, here's a great image that we've created at, at Pixel Dreams, which demonstrates the work that Yushinsky and Parent have done in one of their books where they've determined that in 18, around the 18, late 1800s and 1950, there were two central spikes, certainly in the, UAF, the United States, where here was the end of uh, the second kind of industrial revolution where uh, you know, society was really advancing very, very rapidly. And here, of course, is the Cold War between Russia and the US, McCarthyism and so on. And then this is my conjecture. I, I believe we are currently at another spike because of the pandemic and the number of hours people have had to sit in front of their computers, watch television, hear news 24 seven ad nauseum. And I think it's generated a considerable spike in, in conspiratorial thinking. This is the type of image that I'm hoping will be a go-to image for future discussions about the history of uh, conspiratorial thinking. Something else we need to consider about the way the world is working right now is there seems to be a diametric process going on in the background where we've witnessed over the last 40 years the demise of journalistic integrity and the, ri the quick rise of social media. So the first example I can recall of uh, the use of the term uh, fake news uh, came to me when watching an episode of the, the Mary Tyler Moore show. Most of you youngins out there won't know very much about this show, but those closer to my uh, demographic situation will definitely know. And in this one episode, uh, they work at a, a news station in Minneapolis, right? Here's the broadcast anchor, Ted Baxter, uh, played by Ted Knight. If you haven't seen Caddyshack, please watch it. Um, so he and Mary Richards, Mary Tyler Moore, and Lou Grant, Ed Asner, they go up and talk to the station manager, new station manager, and he wants the news spruced up. He wants it to be more entertaining, more interesting. And uh, Lou Grant says, yeah, no, that's not how we do things. When ratings are down, you know, at a newspaper I worked at, we didn't put the comics on the front page, you know. And then he says the classic line, news is truth, Jack, and I'm not going to make it into something fake. Um, just a great line. It, it happened in 1972. That's the first I can recall of the first reference to fake news. Um, what had happened since then is a gradual shift from one anchor to two anchors. In the 1980s, we started to see a lot more anchors quipping about the news that they were reporting and talking, you know, this nice banter back and forth between various anchors. If you've seen Anchorman with, with Will Ferrell, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, you know, MTV was coming along and presenting new ways of, of, you know, disseminating information. It was the era of big hair. And it was also a time when Ted Turner put together 24 hour news. So a lot of people laughed at CNN when it first came out. I was there, I lived through it. We thought, who wants a 24-hour news station? This will never work. You know, we were all wrong. So if you're wondering now where we're at, this is what it looks like, folks. About 15 billionaires and eight corporations control the information we get. And this generates uh, uh, its own set of problems, right? Um, it should come as a little surprise to witness the way in which those who own these corporations might be able to bias the way the news is going to be presented, especially these folks over here. 
you know, with Murdoch and hiring Ailes and getting this thing set up because they had witnessed so much of the news sliding towards the left, there was really, you know, there was a vi almost violent pushback for a more right-wing uh, uh, perspective. And that's unfortunate that that's how things have evolved, but here we are, right? So with the, de the decline of journalistic integrity, we see simultaneously the rise of social media and the onslaught of information available online. You know, at the turn of the century, you had about 4% of the world's population online. Today, it's over 65, 70%, right? Uh, no other medium has provided more information so quickly, so voluminously, and far-reaching as the net, right? I mean, it's just a major advancement in, in telecommunication. So. What we now have to ask ourselves is, you know, to what extent has the decline in journalistic integrity and the rise of influencers on social media, you know, uh, led to, to what are called news deserts now? Here's a, a great depiction of the various uh, districts and counties and states that have either one newspaper or they're gone entirely. My own hometown of Guelph, Ontario, one day we had the Guelph uh, Daily New Newspaper, you know, we had the Guelph Mercury, and within a week, gone. After 137 years, gone. The newspaper's gone. It's an older medium. I know we can get most of our stuff online. I know we can pick up our phones and we can look up stuff and whatnot. Who wants to get ink on their hands and, you know, who wants all that tactile stuff? Well, older guys like me do. Uh, because when you have a newspaper in your city, you find out what's going on in your own backyard. And when you don't have that, you don't have the same type of accountability. And that's exactly what we're seeing in the States and in Europe and other continents around the world. So it's really important that we have these, these local uh, journalists out there working, getting the story, finding information out, because otherwise, you know, a lot of politicians and other people can get away with, with a lot of stuff because they're not being challenged, not being questioned. Um, then on social media, you have a lot of information that's passing for news, that looks news-like, that has truthiness, as Stephen Colbert, Colbert would call it. Uh, it gives people with little to no authority or experience the capacity to say then whatever they want. And filling the void of this journalistic wasteland with privately run and deeply opinionated websites is really a dangerous path, path to misinformation and worse, disinformation. So the rise of these types of sites contributed significantly to the barrage of misinformation and conspiracy theories now flourishing around the world. And then of course there's the, you know, the omniscient algorithm. What's an algorithm? Well, it's not Al Gore with rhythm. <laughs> That's very clever. Um, we all know what uh, algorithms are, right? They act blindly. They're essentially formulas, like a recipe for baking a cake, we could say, as an algorithm. Follow it exactly, and the end product produces something. Online, we know that they're a little more, um, perhaps, unintentionally malicious. If you've ordered anything on Amazon, and within hours, you'll see suggestions on some of your feeds for other uh, items that are somehow related to that. You can thank the algorithms for churning that out. And, and basically, it's known as nudging you in the direction of maybe making more purchases. Now, on the face of this, there's nothing wrong with this. It's just pure marketing. It's just, hey, you like that toothbrush? Well, check out this dental floss or this toothpaste, right? We're just trying to help you out here, bro. You know, you've ordered this. Maybe you'll like to order that as well. So it seems innocent. But the problem is, is that with conspiracists, when they go online, and they're on a particular site, and they're moving around online, they will get suggestions to look at other conspiratorial thinking. So it's not uncommon. In fact, it's the norm we're finding that people can have conspiratorial beliefs in multiple things. Not Somebody's not just a flat earther. They might be a flat earther and an anti-vaxxer. They might be an anti-vaxxer and anti-masker, and they're all about liberty, right? They could, it, it all can vary, but. The, what has happened now is that the algorithms are so omni, 
omnipresent and, and omniscient, they know everything about you, that they're going to continuously suggest or nudge or promote other opportunities available to the conspiracy theorist. So what has happened is the power of machine learning has enabled these algorithms to nudge you in these various types of directions. Um, you could literally be with your friends side by side looking at the same feed. You're going to have different uh, content simply because of the profile, the online profile that has been generated by these various algorithms. So this is something we're going to have to keep in mind uh, in terms of understanding the process through which conspiracists are functioning. So if we were having this discussion 30 years ago, it might be quite different because the means of communication then you know, you'd have to go to a library, you'd have to get books, you'd have to read things up. You might have to hand write out letters and put them in, in the mail and wait for a response. Or if you had, you know, long distance plans, you might be able to call people up and find out things. You know, it took a lot longer for like-minded individuals to coordinate and to develop communities of thinkers. And so that has all changed. People are connected like that now through the click of a mouse and we're living in what I call the age of immediacy. Things happen way quicker now. So, you know, we have to understand the terrain through which the conspiracist is navigating and, and use it, tr try to use that to our advantage, to be knowledgeable of what's going on. So um, the self-learning algorithms create the perfect environment for conspiracy theorists to meet and then further network with more like-minded individuals. Um, that's why when you see, say, an anti-mask rally, you'll see a number of different groups. It won't just be anti-maskers. It'll be anti-vaxxers, flat earthers. There'll be a few religious groups thrown in there as well. You'll see a lot of different people. And the reason why is because on their Facebook group or however which way they, they, they're meeting on, on social media, they're getting all of these connected suggestions. Hey, there's going to be a rally on this day at this time at this place. And so they can all basically meet up there. They network. Uh, together and then they they have a kind of a, a communal capacity um, just like with with religious beliefs there is a sense of community in in conspiracy theorists where enough like-minded people get together and they support one another they're together on certain ideas and it, and it, it it you know it confirms their biases and we like to have our biases confirmed. It makes us feel good. It makes us feel like we're doing something right, that we're on the right track. And that gives us a kind of a sense of empowerment. And when you have a number of like-minded individuals together doing that kind of thing all together, you think you're, you're doing some good. You think you're actually together. You're, you, know, you're, you, you have a, a, a front developed that is going to take on a specific type of challenge. Um, now, What's happening is uh, this is the next uh, image that we have developed, which shows the inverse proportional relationship between uh, the decline of journalistic integrity and the rise of, of social media. And this has created a kind of a perfect storm environment uh, for conspiracists. Um, now, they have dramatically increased the ease with which information uh, can be dis disseminated, shared, and communicated and uh, brought together as a collective online. Uh, the very operating nature of, of, of these algorithms skews very heavily in favoring pre-existing and self-confirmed biases. So, but you know, as they say, to be uh, forewarned is, is to be forearmed. So in other words, now that we know the processes which have led to our current state of digital evolution, we can then take measures and uh, assure that we can avoid succumbing uh, to the trappings of these types of, of online uh, algorithms. So when we ask ourselves, what can we do about it, right? Aren't we at, at the whim of the algorithms? Eh. Are we that digitally manipulated? Um, are there no independent, reliable sources to which we can refer when dealing with these types of things? Yes, of course there are, right? And I put together lists. For anybody who's interested, if you're ever wondering about, you know, I heard this, or I saw this, or I read this, well, this is only a handful 
of <clears throat> resources that we can go to to basically say, is this bullshit, right? Is this really true? And luckily we have agencies that can do that for us. Now, of course, can these become uh, sullied? Can they become overly biased? Of course, of course they can. But they go at the endeavor of clarification with the foreknowledge that they're trying to suppress their own biases in bringing to light what they believe is most factually true. And that's what we really need. So these are just some of the aspects that are contributing to the what I believe the dramatic increase in development of conspiratorial thinking uh, around the world. When we look at the second part of the book and how we're going to help the conspiracy theorists and then those who are affected by them, you know, some might might ask us, why should we want to help them? Right? They're nuts. You know, they're crackpots. They they're bizarre. You know silly Uncle Dave or crazy Aunt Joan or whomever, they just let them go off, you know, just leave them alone. No, we can't do that, right? These could be our brother or sister, parent, anybody, and we might want to help them, right? And so in order to do this, we've developed a, a profile, uh, a kind of a checklist, as it were. And this will allow people to go through the checklist to consider to what extent the person in their life, the conspiracy theorist in their life, adheres to some of these things on the checklist. And, and the first is, is determining types. What type of conspiracist do you have? How generic are they in their beliefs? They just believe that there could be aliens out there, or are they more specific? No, they believe not only are aliens out there, but they're they're hidden at Area 51. They're living amongst us. My neighbor Dan is one, right? How do we go from the genus to the species? So this is, we're borrowing from biology here and basically classifying. This is known as cladistics in, in biology. We're putting things into classes. How do, we, how do we determine how generic their beliefs are and then what are the, the specifics of their particular beliefs? Uh, the second aspect we have to consider is to what extent is it a knowledge factor? right? Epistemic is just a, from the Greek episteme, which means knowledge. Uh, in other words, you know, there's a lot of people who are bothered by the fact that they don't know something, right? There's more to it than they're telling us, right? We, we have always had a primal need to know, right? Because the more you know, the more secure you are, the more likely it is you're going to survive into the next day. And the less you know, the more likely it is your genes are going to get taken out of the pool. So we've always had a primal need to know, and it's always bothered our species when we became conscious of our situation, why we couldn't answer certain questions. Now, some believe they have answers to those questions. I deal with them the, in that book, the pain in the ass book. But we've always had this primal need to know. And so when we don't know, this state of ignorance often leads to a level of insecurity. Okay, so there's COVID-19. Why? How did it get here? Animals? That's bull crap. It came from the Wuhan Institute of Virology, and it was a bioweapon manufactured by China to bring the world to its knees so they can take over and control us, right? So you, you want to know, you can't just think, no, it didn't just come from animals. It could have been an accident and, and come out of, of that lab, but was it deliberate, you know? So when we're in that state of ignorance, we want, we want answers, right? Because, you know, people get anxious. And, and one of the, the most difficult aspects about the knowledge section of the profiles checklist is this. And that is every now and again, a conspiracy theory turns out to be true. And this is one of the hardest things to deal with because what person, what conspiracist doesn't think they're right, right? Of all the conspiracy theorists I've known and, and spoken to on various levels of the spectrum, they never say, yeah, I think this is going on, but I could equally be wrong. No, those who are in it and those who are that it's now affecting their lives and the lives of those around them can't just simply say, oh, yeah, I could just as easily be wrong. No, they believe that their their ideas are right. And just as Watergate and MK Ultra and a bunch of others, Gulf of Tonkin, those turned out to be true. Those were conspiracies. That's what they're thinking. That for all you know, I'm right here. I'm onto something you don't know. And so it plays into a lot of logical errors known as fallacies. We don't have time to get into all of those today. We'll just cover uh, a few every now and again. 
But it's very difficult when some of them turn out to be true because it gives more credence to the conspiracists to keep going, to, to prove that th theirs is one that turned out to, in fact, be true. There's the feeling of being powerless and wanting to overcome that. And there are those who, who feel sometimes a great lack of control. There's a cover up. COVID is caused by 5G cellular towers that's weakening our immune system. So Bill Gates can sell vaccines to put transmitters in our blood so he can find us. You know, that's what it's all about. And so that people will feel powerless. Then there are those who say, no, no, no. I'm going to dig. I'm going to find out what's going on here. And once I get that power, you know, once I, I get that information, I'm going to be more empowered. I'm going to have status. I'm getting high. This is a great feeling. I know what's going on, you see. So we have to consider blame and attribution, right? When there are calamitous occurrences, major occurrences, lots of people get supported, right? So a lot of people are blaming uh, Chinese officials now that this was a, a engineered bioweapon. They're looking to blame, to attribute it to a specific cause. And that's normal, right? We want to search for the causes. That's what humans do. That's how we find out more about ourselves and our environment. No question about that. Uh, but it often leads to improper blame and attribution. And that's very, very, very dangerous. Now, this is archaic. This, this goes back to our primal days on the African savanna, when there was our little group of 100 or so people moving through uh, the grasslands and looking for if we ever met another group of a hundred or so We don't know to what extent we can trust them or do they know that they can trust us and So that has always generated within us this kind of in-group out-group awareness or identification and This unfortunately has led today to what we're seeing certainly south of the border in the polarization of Democrats and Republicans and then this has further led to identity politics, where people will then use their uh, political beliefs to justify their own identity and their own behavior. And if you're not in our group, and if you're not in our group to this level, you know, even if you might be at this level, you're out. And so what we're seeing is a greater and greater factioning, splintering, schism of these groups that are bifurcating into more and more severe forms to the right and to the left. And it's a very dangerous uh, place to be right now. <clears throat> but unfortunately, that is what we have to deal with. Of course, there's the psychological end of things, right? We know about narcissism. We know about uh, uh, psychopathy and sociopathy. We just talked about xenoph xenophobia and fear of the other. And of course, all of the characteristics that define uh, schizotypy. Uh, this is a particular... Uh, model that is used to um, diagnose uh, various people within um, psychotherapy and uh, psychological analysis. And it's just an acronym having to do with the personality traits of individuals. When uh, we, we look briefly at education, we saw that it skews toward the less educated, but we mentioned that there's plenty of highly educated people who subscribe to these types of beliefs. And perhaps we should more narrowly define education to really be critical thinking. I think that's really what we're talking about here. And then there's endorsement, right? There are those around the world who have acted as, you know, endorsers. You know, you have Trump saying it's just going to go away someday. The, the virus is just going to go away. I'm taking hydroxychloroquine now. I'm using it as a, as a preventative. You know, so a lot of uh, misinformation gets out there. And people who admire these people go, yeah, well, sure. If these guys are you, why shouldn't I use it, right? So, you know, this is known as a fallacious appeal to authority. These people don't know anything about science or they know very little about science in many respects. Um, and to simply abide by the words of a superior because they appear to be in some authority status commits a great uh, logical error known as an appeal uh, to authority. It can get people killed. And in fact, Trump's talking about hydroxychloroquine did get people killed. Uh, some people did consume it and did die because um, it's no, it's a malaria, uh, anti-malaria and um, and uh, lupus uh, medication. So it can affect people's hearts. Um, so we, we have to be very careful about uh, 
listening to people simply because they're in positions of supposed authority. And then, of course, we talked about process, the demise of journalism, rise of social media, the internet algorithms, and then the various types of historical or regional uh, calamities. Now, when a person goes through this checklist, they're in a much better position now to understand the seriousness with which uh, the, the conspiracist in their life has been affected. And so we've created this third uh, graphic, which allows people to consider the extent to which uh, the person has been affected. What is their degree of their commitment to the, their specific conspiracy theory? What is the degree? And what is their likelihood in believing in that for harm, either to themselves or to others? And once we get past a certain line here, uh, there we may be limited in how much we can help that individual. If they are affected by biochemical, neurological issues, then it's going to require a combination of pharmacological interventions, um, SSRIs, SNRIs, some type of medication, along with therapeutic interventions, that is to say behavioral therapies. Um, when a person is like most of us are probably down here, like so many of us might consider that Lee Harvey Oswald didn't act alone in the killing of jo John F. Kennedy. Okay, you know, we're all on the spectrum. It's just a matter of where we are on the spectrum. Uh, clearly, this would be the most dangerous person because they have high conspiratorial beliefs and they're going to act on those. Uh, whereas this person is much more dangerous than this person. And so the extent to which we might have to appeal to getting psychological professional help or appeal to the police in the terms of the danger in which these people might cause to themselves or others, this at least after going through the checklist will help people better understand where, where on, the, on this chart their uh, conspiracy theorist lies. So then in engaging them in conversation, how can we, how can we help? So I talk about the Socratic method and CBT, or Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. Uh, the Socratic method is a dialogue uh, between two people. And Socrates <clears throat> would discuss any issue. And in our case, it's gonna be the issue of conspiracy theory, whatever that happens to be. And what he did is he would feign ignorance, pretend. He would uh, pretend like he didn't know what what was being talked about. So if he's talking about beauty or truth or art or anything like that, he would feign ignorance and he would say, do you know what truth is? Do you know what beauty is? Yes, yes, Socrates, I do. Really? Can you tell me? Because I have no idea. And we have to do the same with the conspiracist. We have to not be judgmental. We have to hear them out and we have to let them talk because they will want to talk. And we're not making any judgments. We're listening to them, we're nodding, we're hearing. Okay, that's fine, right? And then what Socrates would do is every now and again, he would just throw in a question. Oh, hey, you said this a few minutes ago, and now you're saying this. I'm kind of sounding like Joe Biden. Hey, come on, come on now. You said just a few minutes ago, you mentioned this. So what Socrates would do is he would say, okay, you said this at one time, now you're saying this at this time. Those two are contradictory, and I want to believe you, but should I believe you like when you said this, or should I should I now believe you when you say that? And so, when we use cognitive behavioral therapy, which is simply kind of a an appropriation of the Socratic method, using psychological jargon, essentially, um, what we can do is we can use talk therapy and try to get the person to not focus so much on the negative, to let them know that they're in power of controlling how they believe about the information that they're seeing, so that they can take greater control of their beliefs. That's why Stoic philosophy is so much at the heart of, of cognitive behavioral therapy, because it, it talks about the idea of you being in control, you being the one to decide how much you're gonna let this world affect you. And so through a combination of the Socratic method and cognitive behavioral therapy, we found that the pattern of discussion comes down to these four really important phases. Listen, trust, suggest, and repeat. And what this means is we have to hear them, and we have to hear them sometimes for a while. This creates 
a relationship of trust. So if, if you think you're going to convince a conspiracist that they're wrong or misguided by just throwing evidence at them, forget it. Logic, forget it. They're thinking with the limbic system, not the prefrontal cortex. It's emotional. It's here. It's in their heart. It's not up here, right? It's not using rational thought. So you have to listen. You have to gain their trust. Then when the time is right, you make some suggestions. Subtle, nuanced see how they they respond to it and then back off and start listening again you want to keep that trusting relationship should they think at any time you're simply there to prove them wrong or to change their way of being or whatnot they might dig in and they again they might see you as the buzzkill as the one who wants to simply just prove them false right gradually introduce the idea that changing their mind isn't a bad thing because don't forget, there's a lot of negativity put in education in general on being wrong. And I know this is a huge enterprise. I've been trying to do an education for years, but we have to kind of flip the whole education system that ignorance is not a bad place to be. It can be dis you know, discomforting, but it's where all knowledge starts. It's the starting point. And if we can convince people that, you know, changing your mind is not a bad thing, we're literally creating a paradigm shift here in pedagogy, in education, that it's okay to change your mind. Some of you might know who Kyrie Irving is. He's a great basketball player. I believe he's still injured. Uh, Libby, you'll have to uh, inform me, update me on his health condition for the Nets. But um, one of the greatest top, top 10 basketball players in the NBA right now, easily. He was a flat earther for a while, and um, he gradually was convinced that his position was wrong. And that is an amazing thing for somebody to do. What we have to do is champion guys like Kyrie Irving, anybody who was once down the rabbit hole in believing a conspiracy theory and has come out of it. We got to, you know, every time they walk into a room, we got to give them a standing O because if we can create in the minds of conspiracy theorists that others were just like them and they fell into the same trappings and now they've come out, that can go a long way, right? And choosing that right example, knowing that person and whom they value, they're, they love sports, they love entertainment, uh, they're into hip hop, talk about Jay-Z. Right? Talk about anything that they're going to identify with well as people who once thought a particular way and now think differently. That can go a long way towards getting a person to say, yeah, you're right, I'm not perfect, but boy, that, that person, I thought they were smarter than I was or more talented or whatnot, and they were wrong. So, right? Once they get to that point, we have to have an escape plan. Right? Got to have an exit strategy ready for them to be able to, to get out of that uh, that particular uh, state of mind, right? So by using the Socratic method and, and CBT, we can gain the trust while introducing these kind of inconsistencies and contradictions, right, to their story. We can gradually start to introduce the idea of critical thinking, right? It doesn't have to be this book. It can be any book on critical thinking. It will be very difficult to simply have them change their mind in an instant. I would say almost impossible. Um, it's a gradual process, and that's to be expected, right? Because who wants to give up their most cherished views, right? Especially those views which have, in their minds, given them perceived status and, and makes them so high, right? So we have to understand things, like resistance to change is to be expected, right? We have to get it into the minds of the conspiracists that there's really no shame in changing one's mind, right? And that's why we have to have examples ready to demonstrate to them of people who have changed their minds, right? And in this way, we normalize that the changing of beliefs is a good thing as perfectly acceptable and continuously praising the conspiracists for their desire for what they originally thought they were doing which was applying scrutiny and skepticism and critical thinking. Remember, they don't like being called conspiracy theorists. In many cases, they see that as a derogatory term. How dare you call me that? I'm a truth seeker. This is what I do. So we have to show them, fine, let's build on that. You want to find the truth? Let's keep going on that. 
you know, this person thought they were finding the truth. Turns out they weren't, but they were able to reverse that. And now they're in a different place. Let's go together. Let's try to get to that place together, right? And we have to let them know to avoid this, this fallacy, the sunk cost fallacy. And that's the idea that when somebody's committed so much time and energy to a belief, they don't want to give it up. You know, if you've been a flat earther for the last 10 years and somebody is convincing you that you could be wrong, it's like, man, I just spent the last 10 years of my life believing this stuff, going online, arguing with my mom about it, shouting at everybody that I was right and they were wrong. And now I got to change my mind. So we have to let them know that that's okay. Don't worry about it. All the time and energy that you invested in an idea that was wrong is normal. A lot of scientists have done that. Einstein went down some passageways and alleyways that led to nothing. You know, some of the greatest minds in the world have done this. So these are qualities upon which we will use to build that person back up. We will build them back up and we will demonstrate to them how so many others can so easily end up in the same place that they have. And, and we are all capable of, of doing this. None of us are immune from being misguided and thinking in one way when in fact it, it might have been misguided. So we develop an escape plan for them, which they can gradually move into and we have to develop it so that it's compassionate and not certainly non-judgmental, one that's understanding and, and one that's inviting. And we can epistemically move them away from the conspiracy story and minimize their attachment to it while at the same time praising them for taking that journey uh, with you. And this, of course, is a delicate balance of diplomacy indeed. Thank you. Fire.